Hello, everybody, and welcome back to a new Joy of Travel episode. Joining me today, um, my good friends from Italy, TFL Tours, have sent me Paola from Rome. And Rome, of course, is often people's first experience when it comes to arriving in Italy. It's personally one of my very favorite cities in the entire world. And this lucky lady actually gets to live there full time. Welcome, Paola. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> yes, I am lucky. <laughs> you are so lucky. You know, it's so true. It's that, um, you know, Rome, aside from the fact that it's actually very central in um, Italy, like, I mean, technically, if you look at Italy on a map, it's literally almost dead center as far as the coastline goes. So it's an excellent um, destination to sort of start your tour of Italy because you can easily go to any region in Italy via train or, or drive or whatever from Rome itself. But the I think it's that they call Rome the eternal city for a good reason. It is literally the cradle of civilization to some degree, is it not? Yeah, it is absolutely. And as I usually think and say, it is your roots as well as North Americans, as Canadian, you know, you share with the Western civilization. So coming here is like coming to your own hometown. Absolutely. And you know, you're right there. That's absolutely true because there's a huge Italian Canadian um, uh, group of community in Canada. So you're right. That's exactly true. Now, um, the one thing that I noticed, like the Rome actually happened to be the first city in Europe that I ever went to um, as, as a tourist. And as a Canadian, as a North American, I think the first thing that I was hit with was how ancient the, the architecture, these amazing artifacts and, and ruins that you literally walk in and amongst on your way to work. This sort of, I mean, your world is immersed in these amazing places every day of your life. Yeah, we literally stand on the shoulders of giants <laughs> because oh, we have I love that. Yeah, I know the history is surrounding us. It's part of our own past and people really feel, you know, love for oh, everyone. Even the people who are not maybe more educated, but you still feel that is your own roots, your own past. So it is amazing. It is. It's incredible. And I mean, of course, Rome is a massive city. So, I mean, trying to decide what part of the, you know, which district you can stay in, that sort of a thing. I think that's something that um, really justifies the use of someone like yourself, like you're in destination and you are best able to sort of um, direct people to, you know, the best accommodations, the best district to stay in, depending on what your particular interests are, that sort of thing. So again, using an in-destination supplier is wonderful simply from the, um, just the, the, the idea behind where to position yourself for your three, four, or one week stay. Um, one thing I did want to mention where we talk about um, hotels and that sort of thing is, as you mentioned, of course, you're sitting in amongst these beautiful old buildings, these beautiful old um, things like the Colosseum and the Forum and that sort of thing. And of course, what North Americans perhaps don't conceptually understand is that those buildings require enormous amounts for restoration and maintenance. And that's, I think it was about five years ago that the Italian government implemented that city tax. Correct, yes, it was enforced exactly for this reason. It's like three euros 50 per person per night, I think now. Mm -hmm. uh, it has to be paid on the spot. So it's something that's you right. can't pay in advance, but it was made in order to provide some extra money for the maintenance of the city. Because as you correctly said, everything is so old and needs continuous upkeeping, maintenance, restoration. The money is simply never enough. So when you pay the city tax, actually, you know, it goes for a good cause, at least. Exactly. Yeah, and this is why I wanted to mention this, because I very often, it's quite funny, I will get clients emailing me when they go to pay their hotel bill, which they thought their hotel was paid in full. And they're like, they're trying to charge me this extra 16 euros or whatever. And I'm always, and that's why I'm mentioning it in today's episode. It's like, it's right. okay. That's what it's for. All right. So we've been talking in the past about COVID and how it has basically changed people's um, ideas as to how they want to travel and this sort of thing. And of course, Rome can be uh, people's first time 
um, uh, exposure to uh, to Italy. But then there's a lot of people that are perhaps looking at it as their second, third or fourth visit going back to Rome. And today, what we're going to talk about is sort of, again, based on people wanting to sort of get away from the crowds or having unique experiences, we're going to let you lead us on this amazing, um, you know, sort of adventure of sort of, you know, really seeing Rome on sort of off the beaten path. So I'm going to leave it to you to get your um, beautiful presentation started okay. and show me Rome because I want to come back. <laughs> uh, I hope you can really. I will. I will. <laughs> you must. So it'd be my pleasure. So here, let me start my presentation with something that doesn't need a presentation. The Colosseum is obviously an icon of Rome. Everybody wants to see it and everybody does see it. So this is going to be, as you said, more crowded than other places. And the people who visit that normally will also go to the nearby area of the Forum, the Palatine, which you see here to the right, with the ancient ruins of the Imperial Palace, the Circus Maximus in the center with the all the you know, horse and chariot traces. So the whole area is amazing. But of course, it's going to be busy, especially in the high season. And as you said, sometimes you want to get away from all that, right? Absolutely. Here, yeah, here you can, because to the left of the Circus Maximus is another of the seven hills of Rome. That's the Aventine Hill. And that's where I would like to take you. Okay. Because that's, you know, a place that's very central, as you see, just minutes away from the Colosseum, but very much away from the Madden crowd. Uh, okay. It is mostly an upscale residential area, but it's also very green. Now, Rome is a very green city. You remember that, you know? Yes, I do. You don't expect, yes, it. Yes. You don't expect it of a European capital to be, to be so green. So on the Aventine Hill, for instance, we have the city rose garden. That's amazing. It's got more than 1,000 types of roses. And every oh year, gosh. they have a contest for best new rose. And interestingly, because the garden was created over the area of the previous Jewish cemetery, one section, in one section, the paths between the flower beds have the shape of the menorah. That's oh, in homage to the wow. Jewish community of Rome, which is quite large, and it's the oldest in the Mediterranean outside of Israel. So very important. Isn't that amazing? I had no idea. You see? <laughs> and okay. we, meet, we learn something new every morning. Always. Minute. Yes, that's what these shows are about. <laughs> the garden is open only in the months where the roses are in bloom, okay? So April, May, June. So for people, who, garden lovers particularly, who come to Rome in the spring, that's a must to do. Otherwise, in the same area, we can visit the orange garden, which is open all year round. That's planted with orange trees that are bitter, so they're not edible, but they are very decorative. Plus, you have some taller trees. Those are the umbrella pine, which are typical of the landscape of Rome. And they have this mushroom shape, which is right. not cool. They grow up like that. They're not trimmed and no. give shade in the summer. So it's the orange true. garden is facing west, as you see. So it's particularly nice at sunset, very sunset. romantic. Huh? And it's got oh, a great, a great yes. view over <laughs> the city, yes, with the River Tiber, the city centre, also the Jewish synagogue in the background, and the area of Trastevere that we will mention later. Now, according to tradition, the very first orange tree in this area was planted by Saint Dominic in the 13th century in the wow. cloister of the nearby church of Saint Sabina. And it's still there, it's visible from a hole in the wall of the portico of the church. So after visiting the garden, we can go visit the church of Saint Sabina. Already the door is amazing. That's a wooden door from the fifth century. Wood that has survived 1500 this years. This is all carved. It's this carved, is all carved by hand. Carved in wood with stories from the Bible. And we have the very first picture of the crucifixion that we know of. That seems quite, you know, it's obvious, a Christian church, you have the crucifix, but actually it took 500 years for the Christians before they, they painted or carved this kind of subject. So this is the very first, very important. And then we enter the church. Oh. And again, we oh, find God. ourselves in a different dimension, very peaceful, very spiritual. When I say spiritual, it's beyond religion. Doesn't matter what religion you are. This is speaking to everybody's heart of beauty and calm. 
it's bathed in light, very simple, you know, very different from the typical churches of Rome, like the St. Peter's, you know, Baroque, which are beautiful in their own way, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Very do they hold masses? In, do they hold masses? They do, they do, they do and well, oh, they do. Well. Okay. Yes, it's a regular church, regular and special at the same time. And there are some important works of art, like this mosaic, also from the fifth century. Mosaic means it's made of tiles, so painted glass and gold leaf. The Latin inscription is commemorating the inauguration of the church, while the two women on the sides represent like the sources of the Christian religion. To the left, the Jewish communities, to the right, the pagan. Okay. There are other churches as well, like St. Alexis or St. Anselm, which is very new because it's only 120 years old now for Italy. That's yesterday. That's, that's a baby. <laughs> it's, very, it's very popular for weddings because of its great location. And in the garden, we meet a peculiar little shop run by the Benedictine monks. You know, the Benedictine friars and nuns have a motto in Latin, ora et labora, pray and work. So it is pray the and work. Of okay. their own work that they sell here, which includes soap, chocolate, uh, cookies, but also crafted beer and liquor. So pray, oh. work, but also enjoy. And eh? don't forget the enjoy part, which in Italy is always very important. No kidding. I love those Italian monks. <laughs> <laughs> and after that, we exit in the square that's surrounded by a stone wall with weird symbols and obelisks, because on the side, we have the headquarters of the Knights of Malta. You know, the Knights of Malta are similar to the Knights Templar. They were created at the time of the Crusades to provide assistance to the pilgrims in the Holy Land. Okay, okay, so they were a religious, military, and medical order. Nowadays, they do international cooperation, and their headquarters are right here behind the stone wall and a brazen door off limits. But we can go near the door and look through the keyhole. Now, normally, you shouldn't do that, but in this case, you can and you must because when you look, surprise, surprise, that's where you oh, see. Oh, an amazing this is the, view. This is the view through the keyhole. Yes, oh, this is the Church of St. Peter's, framed by the Gallery of Trees. Actually, that's very far away because that's on the other side of the river. Right. By a weird optical effect, it looks right there. And this never fails to get a wow out of my clients. Oh, I, I bet. Them. No kidding. What a hidden little secret. I love yes. this. Yes, I, I think the, the Aventine Hill altogether is really to be suggested because it, it really stands like a hidden treasure in the middle of Rome. Just in the middle. And as you say, I mean, if you're a first time visitor to Rome, by all means, you know, do the Colosseum. There's even some private tours that you can do of the Colosseum that'll get you away from the, the crowds and then do the Vatican. And again, there's private, you know, um, options to be doing things like that as well. But again, implementing something like this, which, you know, the typical, we don't have these photos. We don't have these opportunities unless you have somebody like yourself who's such a local and so educated in the area that can sort of share this with us. It's fabulous. Now, a lot of people, of course, that go to Rome, their big focus is on the art and on the history, right? So yes. there must be lots of opportunities that are somewhat different than the norm in Rome. And that you've got other options for that, right? Of course, of course, if you let me, I'll take you from these to the other side of the river. And we go from sacred to profane <laughs> to see the Villa Farnesina. This is a Renaissance villa. Villa means a suburban home. Now it is not suburban anymore. And that's Renaissance. So of course you have art, you have a history. But in this case, history also means gossip. So if you're ready for some Renaissance gossip from 500 years ago, I'll tell you some as we look at the pictures. Okay. And this villa was built for Agostino Chigi. He was a banker from Siena. He was sent to open a local branch of the family business here in Rome, and he became so rich that he lent money to the Pope, just imagine. And he had the villa. <laughs> wow. <laughs> he had the villa built for himself, and he went to live there with his mistress at the time, Francesca. Now, this was already very inappropriate. Plus, the girl was of a humble origins, and the family had different plans for Agostino. They wanted him to marry a marquis to get the aristocratic title, but Agostino was used to have his own way in everything, and so eventually he did marry Francesca. And the reception was held at the villa, and he was celebrated by the Pope himself, because, of course, he owed money to the guy, so at least he could do. He owed money. <laughs> yeah, and so, you know, it's the, the beginning of the mafia. Right? <laughs> and it was lavish. You know, apparently they used silver and golden plates 
that after every course were thrown off into the river Tiber and then retrieved by the servants of Agostino, oh, yeah. of course, because the man was rich but not stupid. And not stupid, yeah, okay. <laughs> The villa was decorated by the best artists of the time, and all the stories are somehow connected with the personal love story of Agostino and Francesca. For instance, in the upper floor, in the very bedroom of the newlyweds, painter Sodoma represented another famous wedding from the past, that of Alexander the Great and Roxanne, who was the daughter of the enemy general. So the message Agostino is sending is if Alexander the Great can marry his enemy's daughter, why can I not marry Francesca? Right? Wow. And but downstairs, this is like forever. Yeah. <laughs> downstairs in the loggia, the best artist of the time, Raphael, huh? Raphael himself, painted the story of love and psyche. That's a Greek myth in which Psyche, a normal woman, gets to marry Eros, the very god of love, and becomes uh -huh. the goddess herself. So again, the message Agostino is sending to his family is please accept Francesca, just like the gods accepted Psyche. Huh? It's all a bit passive aggressive, right? Because to well, send the message to your family, you have your entire house redecorated. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, but I like that he stood by his woman like that. That's good. <laughs> very, very much in love, very much in love. And Raphael and Agostino became sort of friends. And we can easily imagine that one of their favorite conversation topics was women because also Raphael was fam for, famous for being a ladies' man. Exactly. And apparently, his famous lover, La Fornarina, the baker's daughter, he met while he was going to work at the villa. He saw her at the window, they fell in love and they started to date. Agostino immediately realized something had happened. You know, uh, Raphael was uh, distracted, head in the cloud, uh, dreamy eyes. And so he said, Hey, Paul, what's going on? And Raphael replied, hey, You know, I met this girl. Agostino knew what to do. He had the girl come and stay over at the villa so she could keep Raphael company, <laughs> give him inspiration, and Raphael could concentrate on his work. And there's oh. also was gossip to come, but we will leave something for the people that come and visit this place, right? That's right. That's right. I love it. Stories are the best. I love it. It goes to show that so little has changed. <laughs> yes, some things never oh, change, let me tell you. <laughs> so little has changed. Now, um, moving on from this, we've got, there's a number of different sorts of museums as well. I mean, typically, I mean, I've done the museums at the Vatican and um, sure. I know there was something else, but you've got some more unique, different well, ones out there. Yeah, well, we have hundreds of museums, but this one is very special. It's one of my favorite. It's called Centrale Montemartini. Centrale means power station. Okay. okay. Montemartini was the name of the guy in charge for technology for the city of Rome when this was built, 1912. Now, this power plant was fed by coal. That means it was already a little old fashioned at the time. So it became totally obsolete after Second World War. It was basically abandoned. But in the 1980s, the place was restored. And in the 1990s, due to major renovation works in the Capitol in museums, part of the archaeological collection there was moved to the power plant to be put on display. It was meant to be a temporary solution, but people loved it so much that it became a permanent museum. And so the special thing is the setting, because you have these huge black boilers, steam yeah. engines, diesel turbines, and then nearby, the beautiful white marble statues of the gods, the dancing names, the thoughtful music. So at first it strikes you as contrast, but after a while, you realize there is a connection because the statues are as perfect and as functional as machines. So everything falls into place. The collection is unique, exquisite, really. There are beautiful mosaics, everyday objects, uh, especially statues, both Roman and Greek, in white marble or sometimes in black marble, just the oh. same view as the machinery behind. I think the visual effects are really amazing. And the whole museum is not too big. It's maybe one hour, one hour and a half. So okay. enjoyable as a size, hardly ever crowded. This is an amazing mosaic floor from the fourth century with a hunting scene where the oh animals God. are captured, not to be killed, but to be used later in the Colosseum for the fights. In this detail, <laughs> you see how they capture a bear. Now look at that. They open, they, they keep, they hold a cage open with a ham hanging inside. So when the bear goes in to hit the ham, it's taken. Poor bear. I get it. Yeah. This is an and amazing. 
articulated doll exactly yeah. from 1900 years ago like a barbie doll from the past this would have all the dresses you know again we haven't invented very much really you know you're isn't that true that is a very profound statement you're right we've maybe yes. improved on things but i'm wondering when a truly unique idea is going to come out of our our generation <laughs> we recycle that's it we're recycling yeah Yes, and in the last room we have an actual train from 1848 that was donated to the Pope, Pope Pius IX. Of course, being the train of the Pope, it's a bit different. One carriage is shaped as a, shaped as a balcony so that when the train called at the stations, the Pope could come and bless the people that came to see him. Another carriage is the private chapel, obviously you expect it of the Pope. Another is the throne hall where the Pope could receive official visits. So, and you know, it's different as a museum. And after visiting the museums, we can see the whole area to explore because the area around the place is amazing. It's called the Testaccio, and it's a former industrial and working class residential area, which has now become the fashionable district for the arts, the nightlife, and as usual is a mix of all the new. We have some industrial side to it, but also you turn a corner and you bump into a pyramid uh, from the time of, let's say, Julius Caesar. Remember, Julius Caesar had a little affair with Cleopatra, right? Right, so right. Rome conquered Egypt. They were fascinated with the, Egypt, the Egyptian art. And this guy here, Caius Cestius, had his own tomb shaped as a pyramid. Right. But for the most part, the area is modern. There are other museums like this one, which has been created inside the structures of the previous Zlora House, eh? much nicer now. Well, there no are kidding. places for arts exhibits, or open areas for outdoor events. There is a market specialized in fair trade and sustainable products, very interesting. And also we have the farmer's market. That's where we local go shopping and so you can see this place it's very colorful and noisy as you can easily imagine and with the finish, italians in their hands <laughs> yeah yeah well the vendors you know you can imagine how they promote their uh, goods yeah. in the most colorful ways and uh, to finish the area you know in one section of the statue you have a hill which is artificial it's made of pottery shards these pottery were discarded from the nearby ancient Roman port along the river Tiber. You know, when the amphorae, the big vases arrived containing oil or wine, they were emptied and then they were broken because they were smelly. They could not be reused. So okay. all the broken pottery were accumulated and it became a hill. And then in the 1800s, they dug tunnels into the hill to be used as cellars, you know, for keeping the wine. And a lot of these have been turned into wineries and restaurants. So the area of the statue is, for instance, a great area for eating out and trying the local cuisine. Wow. And what was the name of the area? The statue. The statue, because I actually have never heard of that before. So that's going to be something I'm going to keep in mind. That's <laughs> amazing. Oh, it's so cool. And to imagine that this hill is actually created out of something that is dated so back you know the thing too i gotta point out is that one photo that you showed of the pyramid and that is the epitome of what rome is all about honestly you can be looking at a skyscraper or a brand new hotel and literally just turn around and boom there's something that's like three thousand years old <laughs> it's just it's amazing the way you live your lives in and amongst living history it's just incredible now one of the things that people go to Italy for, and Rome especially, is the food. And the food, I'm telling you, there is nothing like pasta made fresh in Italy. <laughs> I can attest to this everywhere I've gone. Rome is exquisite, amazing food tours. Please tell us you have something like that. There you go. <laughs> well, the Roman cuisine is really international now because like carbonara was invented in Rome. And I here did we not have a matriciana, which is with the bacon and the tomato, or it's other version without tomato that's called the gricia, that's just bacon and pecorino cheese, and the beloved cacio e pepe, cheese and pepper, eh? which yes. is also suitable for vegetarians, just in case, for the meat. This is, this is called salt in bocca. It literally means jump into my mouth. It's so oh. good that you don't even have to make the effort. And it's veal with a slice of parma ham on top and a, a leaf of sage. So it's cooked okay. in the pan, you know, with the flour and butter. 
And then we have the artichoke, and that's a must in the Roman cuisine. You know, the artichokes, we cook them in many different ways. The two most important recipes are alla romana, which is the Roman way, this way, that's stuffed with garlic, mint, herbs, and then it's cooked in a casserole. Or alla Judea, the Jewish way, which is deep fried. So it's deep fried in boiling oil, so it gets all crispy, and it's served upside down, so you can pick the leaves like crisps. And then right. it's middle. Mm, delicious. I've never, I've never seen artichoke either way. <laughs> yeah, I, well, honestly, I wouldn't even more. have known that that was artichoke. I'm like, I've never seen that before. That's incredible. Now these are little risotto balls. I know about these. Yes, yes, this is the yeah, you know, the typical Roman street food. It's called the soupli, which comes from the old and correct habit of not wasting food. So the risotto leftovers the next day would be made into rice balls. Of course, nowadays they make them afresh. And they put a piece of mozzarella in the middle, so it's covered in breadcrumbs and fried. And when it's hot and you open it, it melts. And this gives it an extra name, supli al telefono, telephone supli. I know that for the younger generation, this makes no sense. But for people yeah. my age or older, we remember the actual telephone with the wire. With the wire. <laughs> OK. Yes, yeah, so the melting mozzarella is meant to look like the Your exactly. cord. Yeah. And the name. <laughs> You're and, right. My children would have no idea what you're talking exactly, about. Exactly. You know, that just goes to say how old I am. Anyway, and me too. Food, I know. With the local wine, obviously, uh, you can try it when you're here. But I mean, so TFL, I know for a fact, you guys actually have some amazing people that will take you around on these wonderful uh, food tours. And you mentioned like this about the street food tours, which are just an amazing way of really immersing yourself into the actual culture of a region. One thing about Italy, I know too, is that um, each region or even each city is very territorial in regards to their recipes and their, um, you know, their, um, their, their signature dishes. So what would you say Rome is the proudest of? Well, this is, I would say these kind of things here. Yes. Yeah. Okay. This is just perfect. I love it. Yeah. Now, if we were, after we're all full <laughs> and we're going to yeah. move on, um, show me one last thing that a typical tourist would never find on their own, something that is really off the beaten path. Well, after eating so much, we need to walk. Absolutely. So I'll take you on a journey. And for a journey, we need the road. And now all roads lead to Rome. That's because all roads start from Rome. OK, the Romans were the great road builders. And the most important road they built was the Appian Way. Uh, that was built 312 before Christ, so that's 2300 years old. It was called the Queen of the Roads. Why? For two reasons. First, because it went straight down from Rome to, let's say, north of Naples. Then it crossed the Apennines to the back of Italy, you know, the heel of the boot, where it could sail to Greece. And secondly, because for the first time it was as large as to let two chariots go at the same time. Oh, Before okay. that, when you met another chariot, one of the two had to pull over. Now, no more. So it is the first two lanes highway of the ancient yes. world. Two lane highway. <laughs> exactly. So it starts from within the city. And if you follow the route, of course, after a while, you meet with the city walls, right? Rome still has the ancient Roman wall from uh, the 270, 275 AD, Emperor Aurelian. Of course, now this wall encloses the old city. Rome is much bigger. And of course, for every road, you meet a gate. You know, the gates, this is the Appian Gate, were closed at nighttime, open during the day. Inside, there would be a checkpoint, a roadblock, and customs. And this section of the city wall is accessible. So you can actually enter and climb into the towers and through the passageways in the thickness of the wall, just like the sentinels from the olden days. This is amazing for children, but I would say for children of all ages, because it's really unique. Absolutely. Oh, it's incredible. That is just absolutely wonderful. Now, is this something you can walk to from downtown or do you have to take a uh, you, you better Uber take the car because you it's a little out. It's further out from the Colosseum, let's say. Okay. And especially the thing is that you can go further out. So after this, if you take the car again, you can leave the city behind. And after a while, you have to leave the car as well because you meet with the ancient Roman paving. That you see here of course this is uneven but imagine it was nice and flat at the time 
and that gives you an impression, an idea of how the Romans built the roads. You know, they excavated the bed first, they put stones at the bottom to prevent leaks of water, and then layers of gravel and sand, highly pressed, and the top was paved with the local stone, in this case, volcanic rock, that's basalt, wow. which is the same stone we use in the more recent cobblestone. See, to the left, you have the 200 years old cobblestone, to the right, the ancient Roman, uh, with also the grooves of the chariot wheels. Uh, so this is what you see if you look down. And if you look up, that's what you see. You find yourself in the countryside, although you're still in the middle of Rome, mind. But it's peaceful, quiet, birds singing, old homes covered in ivy and wisteria. And of course, you will also have ancient ruins. Now, what kind of ancient ruins? What would be along the ancient Roman roads? Two things. First, the suburban villas of the rich. This was the villa of the Emperor Maxentius that included the circus, not a circus like clowns, but like the circus Maximus, you know, horse yeah. and chariot races, only right. it was private. The other thing you would find would be cemeteries. I know the subject may not be pleasant, but we're speaking about 2000 years ago. So now they're just documents of the past. The Romans were buried outside of the city. Some of the cemeteries were underground and that's the catacombs. Right. But you can actually go underground for miles, these corridors go and you're in the dark. It's very, it's creepy, but fascinating. You know, you feel like Indiana Jones discovering the underground burial places of the ancient Romans, the Christians. Otherwise, you have above ground mausoleum, which were on the sides of the road. They had to be visible because people wanted to be remembered. So the more you could spend, the bigger the tomb and the closer to the road. More memorable, so passing right. by, Yes, could see you and they knew already who were the families that met before entering the city. And one example is the mausoleum of Cecilia Metella. That was owned by, was made for a woman living, let's say, more than 2,000 years ago. We don't know much about her. You know, women at the time didn't count very much. The only information that the inscription is giving us are the names of her father and her husband. So okay. she's entirely defined by the men in her life. But the tomb is beautiful. So either they must have loved her very much or they must have cared very much about their own reputation. Exactly. Later on, well. the mausoleum was included in a castle built 1,000 years ago by the Caetani family across the Appian Way in order to control the street and take a toll from passers-by. This is now in ruins, but I think it adds to the flavor and the romantic feeling of the place. And it also includes a little church, which is also in ruins, uh, dedicated to St. Nicholas, which is one of the only two old churches that we have in Rome in the Gothic style. You know, the Gothic is the pointed arch, right? The pointed, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that was invented in the north of Europe. We don't have much of that in Italy and very little in Rome. So this is very important. So the whole area, I think, is amazing because it's a great mix of natural beauty and human artifacts that reach out through the centuries to speak about these people from so long ago who were, after all, not very different from us. Oh, this is just beautiful. Absolutely gorgeous. Thank you so much, Paola. Well, you liked it. <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, for me, because it's new to me too, a lot of this I haven't seen either. So that's my point, is that even if you have been to Rome a couple of times in the past, there's still so much to see. TFL Tours is absolutely the perfect guide to take you and budget something according to what you want to see. They'll give you these incredible opportunities um, and suggestions of things that are sort of, again, off the beaten path, away from the crowds, getting you those unique photographs that nobody else has, especially when you're having to do your PowerPoint, right? <laughs> Paola, thank you so very much for joining us this afternoon. It was really such an amazing walk. I cannot wait to get back to Italy. Italy is open, I understand, for visitors. It's starting to open up, so we will be seeing you soon. Thank you again so much. It was my pleasure. Thank you to Thank everyone you. else. Thank you again. Thank you to everyone else for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed this little walk through Rome and that you definitely add it to your next travel bucket list. Bye-bye for now.